let's discuss the economic rights of the women in Islam. Islam gave women the economic rights 1400 years ago, 1300 years before the Western world. When the Quran was revealed at the advent of the Prophet Muhammad, any adult woman, whether married or unmarried, she was allowed to own or disown the property without the permission of anyone else. If we read history, the first time the Westerners gave right for a married woman to own or disown the property without the permission of the husband was in 1870s, under the Special Married Women Property Act. And this Special Women's Marriage Property Act was further revised in 1882 and 1897. Imagine, Islam gave rights to the woman to own or disown 1300 years before the Western world. In Islam, a woman is financially more secured. Before she's married, it is the duty of her father and her brother. And after she's married, it's the duty of her husband and her son to look after her financial aspects, lodging, boarding, clothing, and all of the financial aspects. She need not work for a living. Financially, a woman is secured. It is the duty of the man in the house to earn the living. The financial burden is put on the shoulders of the men in Islam. But if both the ends don't meet and the woman wants to work, she can work as long as it is within the purview of the Islamic Sharia. She maintains the hijab and she follows the Quran and say hadith because there's no verse in the Quran which prohibits a woman to work as long as it is not against the Quran and the Sai Hadith. There are many professions which are prohibited for the woman. Those professions which exhibit the body, for example, modeling, acting, dancing, all these professions, they are haram for the woman. It's prohibited. Furthermore, there are many professions which are prohibited for the woman as well as the men. For example, working in alcoholic bars, working in gambling den, doing dishonest business, cheating, bribing, all these are prohibited for both men and women. There are many professions which are noble and we want the woman to do. There are some professions which if the women want the, both the ends to meet, they can do. For example, they can do cooking at home, pottery, weaving, knitting, they can work in places which have got segregation of sexes, where the modesty is protected, where the hijab is maintained. They can take up noble professions such as teaching. They can become nurses and doctors. If I want my wife, my mother, my daughter to maintain a hijab, but natural, we should make our women folk, some of them as doctors. But if we analyze in Islam, the woman is financially secured. She need not work for a living. It's the duty of the man to look after the financial burden. Before she's married, as I mentioned, it's the duty of the father and the brother. And after she's married, it's the duty of the husband and the son to look after her lodging, boarding, clothing, and all financial aspects. She need not work. But if she works, and if that work is within the purview of the Islamic Sharia, then whatever she earns, she need not spend on the family. She can keep it for herself. That's her right. But if she wants to take part and help in the financial aspects, she can. But no one can force her. In Islam, during marriage, the woman is on the receiving end. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number four. Wa to Nisa, satukatahinna nehla that gift to the woman in marriage a door as a gift. In Islam, maher, that is a marital gift, is compulsory for a marriage to solemnize. Without maher, a marriage cannot solemnize in Islam. In Indian culture, where we live, it is the opposite. It is 
the woman who gives dowry to the would-be husband. In Islam, it's opposite. It is the man who gives to the would-be wife maher, a marital gift, a dower. But unfortunately, in the Muslim society, many of us have made it as a joke. You know, in India, we keep maher as 786 rupees. You can't even buy a pair of shoes with 786 rupees. And for namesake, they keep 2,000 rupees or unnis miskal. You know, saying that the Prophet kept unnis miskal as maher. If you have the same wealth as the Prophet and Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. And if you give unnis miskal, 19 miskal, good. You may be having 10 times, 100 times more wealth than what the Prophet had and Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. And you want to give unnis, you have to give 190, 1900 miskal if you want to follow the Prophet. They spend on the weddings lavishly. They may keep the nikah in the mosque for namesake. But a walima on a big ground, spending lakhs of rupees, millions of rupees, and they want to keep a maher as 786. They want to make a mockery of Islam. The Indian culture, unfortunately, some of the Muslims, they are being influenced by the Indian culture. You know, in Indian culture, it is the woman that gives the dowry to the would-be husband. And you know, depending upon the market, if you want to marry a graduate, you may have to give 5 lakh rupees, half a million rupees. If you want to marry an engineer, you have to give 10 lakh rupees, 1 million rupees. If you have to marry a doctor, you may have to give 50 lakh rupees, 5 million rupees. As though herds and cattle are being sold in the marketplaces. In Islam, to demand dowry from the would-be wife is haram. It is prohibited. Demanding directly or indirectly, both prohibited. You can't tell the parents of the would-be bride that my son, he likes to travel in a Mercedes car. Give an indication, I want a Mercedes car for dowry. You know, my son, he likes to live in a three-bedroom apartment. Give an indication that you want a three-bedroom apartment for dowry. Demanding dowry directly or indirectly is prohibited in Islam. If willingly, if the parents of the girl, the bride want to give some gift to the daughter, there's no problem, but you cannot force or cannot ask or request directly or indirectly, it is prohibited in Islam. So if you analyze in Islam, the woman, they're on the receiving end during marriage. And furthermore, irrespective, the woman may be very rich. The wife may be very rich or she may be poor. Irrespective of whether the husband is rich or poor, it is yet the duty of the husband to look after the food, clothing, lodging, and all financial aspects of the wife. He cannot say, okay, my wife is rich, I'm poor. Yet it is his duty. Furthermore, just in case, if divorce takes place, or if a woman gets widowed, she gets maintenance for the idda period, for the waiting period. And if she's pregnant, it extends till she gives delivery of the child, till she gives birth of the child. And if the child is born, she even gets financial support till the child grows up.